Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is John 3, verse 12. I'm going to back it up one verse. So Pardon me? I'm backing it up one, one verse. So okay. John 11. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then do you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Amen. Amen. Our blessed Trinity welcomes you. And may you be the light of Jesus, the light of Jesus' love. May it shine on you throughout the service and through the week ahead. In the way of announcements, um, first of all, thank you, Dan, for making up bulletins. And uh, thank you, Nancy, for suggesting it. So we have bulletins, and on the back of the bulletins is a uh, a little chart which has all of the things that are going to happen, um, including Mary Wynn having a birthday next week. <laughs> we can pass on this one, that's okay. And Wendy having a birthday this week as well. And the time changes next week, so uh, if you can put that onto your calendar so uh, you don't come an hour late. Because we will probably be pretty much finished. Um, the, uh, the hike for hospice is not on there. Um, but uh, it doesn't happen until May the 7th, but you may be contacted for that. Um, the Lenten lunch is a week from month, uh, Wednesday. Our writer's supper is on there for the 18th, so you can get ready for that as well. Um, other than that, um, there's a Zoom meeting for the Women's Baptist, and the rest of them you can look at at your pleasure. and. Um, they should be appearing every week. This time I would like to lead you in our prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Lord God, we come into your presence with awe and wonder at the love and grace that you freely give us day in and day out. You, O oh Lord, are our, almighty, are our almighty God, the anchor for our souls the giver of salvation and peace in this troubled world. We come in humble gratitude for the forgiveness of our sins and with the Holy Spirit's guiding and ongoing work of sanctification, making us acceptable for eternal life with you through the cross as we will celebrate at the end of this service. As we sing, shine, Jesus, shine, expand our voices so that they can reach your heavenly throne and may be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. We see a challenge in our second song. We pray for strength unequal to the task to raise up and make your church great. The prayer in our last song ends with true grace when we shall see you face to face. What a wondrous, humbling prayer that is. Prayer is an awesome privilege we have as a family of faith. Father, we ask you to be attentive to all of our prayers, pastoral, silent, this prayer, prayer for the offering, prayer to add a blessing on the message and for the Lord's Supper. This morning our prayers of commission and omission we lay before you as we do now in silent personal prayer or meditation. Lord, what joy, what peace we find in your presence week after week. Keep us from falling into bad habits like the church in Sardis. Continue to give us wake-up calls as you do every week with the words spoken by Pastor Shannon. Give her the insights we need to, to give us what we need to hear. Heavenly Father, we ask a special blessing on this service. You are holy, you are worthy, to receive all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first song this morning is Shine, Jesus, Shine, number 431, and we ask you to stand as you are able.
seated. Offer a word for the offering that has been collected. Father, as we see the beginnings of spring with the sun being stronger, the maple sap running, we look forward to spring bursting forth. We thank you for the offering which, con which continues to bring out the love that we have for you and our church. Pour out your blessing on this congregation as we prayerfully seek to follow you in word, thought, and deed, which this offering represents. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our responsive reading is uh, on the overhead and in your bulletin, so uh, you can follow it either spot. I would like to lead you in that at this time. It comes from Ephesians 5, 5 through 11, and 13 through 17. For of this you can be sure, no immortal, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once our hearts, and now we are in the Lord. Live as children of life, for the first fruit of life consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And I know what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes the light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, and rise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every Therefore, do not be foolish. Amen. You get the opportunity to sing once again from number 433. Rise up, O Church of God. I ask you to stand as you are able. to help 
our oldest son Connor and his wife Tanya to move to uh, their new house in Belleville. Um, I have never felt so old <laughs> and sore in my life. <laughs> we've moved, you know, we've helped move the kids, uh, both of them, whenever they've moved. And um, we've already told Emerson and Alicia that was it for them. They've had our last <laughs> assistance with that move. I'll cook food or clean or whatever, but. And so this was Connor and Tanya's turn to hear that mom and dad weren't going to be hoisting boxes. Uh, that's what we're saying now, anyway. Um, uh, anyway. So, on that topic of feeling sore and old, um, a few weeks ago, Sharon forwarded me a video. And when I thanked her for it, uh, she said Emily had sent it to her. So, um, this isn't the very same video, but it's the same content. Um, when it went past the uh, quality control there of Dan, um, that one was a little too fuzzy for his liking. So, um, he found an equivalent that uh, I'd like to share this morning. <laughs> for loving us in all of our situations and conditions and Lord help us so that we would always turn to you and depend upon you through Jesus we pray Amen. 
And I know we've mentioned it in the bulletin, but I really appreciate the uh, members of the auxiliary for um, putting on the Word, World Day of Prayer on Friday. Uh, it's beautiful downstairs, and we had lovely uh, refreshments, and um, it was nice to have people from other churches here um, praying together with us. Let us pray together. Let's pray. Gracious God, our loving liberator, every day you summon your slumbering people. Forgive us our lethargy in seeking your truth and responding to needs and to treating others the way in which we like to be treated. Stir up within us a desire to repentance. For we read in Proverbs that whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Father, we struggle to do what we should, and we falter in refraining from doing what we should not. In our weakness, we turn to you asking for forgiveness in the name of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Wash away our guilt. Help us to find our worth and strength in you. Help us to catch a vision of your kingdom and a willingness to offer ourselves to your labors and priorities. Enlighten our lives with your grace so that we might fully give ourselves to Christ's mission and ministry so that people would recognize the impact you have on our daily lives. Holy and almighty maker, we are humbled that Jesus gave himself up as our atoning sacrifice so that through faith in him we would be reconciled to you and gifted with the Holy Spirit as our comforter and guide. We are indeed a blessed people. Help us to be transformed into Christ's likeness. Comfort us in our mortality and strengthen us to walk the path of your desire, so that by word and deed we may embody the gracious news of your faithfulness and love. Your goodness to us, Heavenly Father, exceeds our understanding. Many, many are the mercies you grant to us daily. We thank you for faith and family, for health and home, and for ability and strength. We praise you for the joy of new birth and upcoming births in the Longland, Ryan, Chen, Vanden Heuvel, Jance, and Stewart families. We praise you for the community of believers. We thank you for our life and breath. Father, we thank you for Sharon's good report. Lord, may it continue to be good and wonderful news. We pray for people in need, for those for whom life is a bitter struggle, for those fighting addiction. Lord, provide for them. For the groups that meet here and groups wherever they meet, may they find encouragement and, su and success in overcoming what ails them. Father, for those who have lost their will to live, be they young or elderly at home or in hospital, Heavenly Protector, we implore you to step into their hearts and their lives so that they would find strength in your presence. Dear God, give them a friend of faith. Help them to see that there is hope, that there are people who care for them. Renew them, Lord. Breathe new life into them. Banish the darkness from their thoughts and souls. For those who are in need of the necessities of life, Lord, keep us from being hard-hearted. Let us be seers and doers so that people would recognize you in our works. For those fleeing tyranny, violence, and poverty, keep them safe. Help them to reach their destination, and Lord, help receiving countries to be compassionate and supportive. Keep safe those Red Cross workers taken in northern Mali. Hinder and confuse and stop the plans of those who seek to do evil. 
for surviving accident vis victims, for parents who have lost children, for those who have suffered violence, for the Iranian schoolgirls who have been poisoned, for the victims of train derailments and transport crashes of all kinds, and for their families, for Helen, for Jenny, and for all those facing terminal illness. Lord, help them trust in you to reconcile with family, to be comforted. For all those whose lives have been clouded by death or loss, we ask for your comfort. Provide for Rose and Bob and for all who have lost a spouse. Jesus, you spoke and people were healed. You touched people and they were healed. When people followed your instructions in faith, they were healed. Messiah, we bring before you Chris, Doug, Roberta and their family, Marion, Jim, Henry and Marg. And for each one here who needs your healing touch, we pray for the health and well-being of Liv, Grace, Mary Lou, Irene, Bonnie, Louise, Lauren, Mary, Ken, and Faye. We bring before you, Lord, our families, neighbors, and friends, and those who hate us. We ask for your mercy and blessing upon them. In these next few moments, we bring before you all those weighing heavy upon our own hearts who need to be encouraged, who need to experience your merciful healing in their bodies, in their minds, and in their spirits. We pray for our leaders and for all who are in authority over us as they debate a seemingly endless list of policies and claim to seek solutions to numerous problems. Dear Lord, inspire them to choose according to your standards. May they be quick to listen and slow to speak, quick to action and slow to partisanship. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns <clears throat> with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, <clears throat> now and forever, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, <clears throat> forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> As we continue into the book of Revelation, hear what is written in the third chapter, verses 1 to 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, 
and you will know at what time I will come to you. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my God and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Please pray with me before I begin. Father, wake us up to the warning found in your word. May the truth and power of your word prevail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> According to Business Research Insights, the sale of alarm clocks is projected to rise 4.6% percent in the U.S. in the next five years. I know that I am definitely not in the market for a new alarm clock. <laughs> I have Dan. <laughs> However, the sensor wake invented by French student Guillaume Roland in 2016 does sound interesting. His alarm clock wakes people up with aromas like tantalizing cappuccino. The smell of the beach, that could be a little tricky. <laughs> Invigorating mint, exotic citrus, sweet cookies, or the outdoorsy smell of fresh cut green grass, to name a few. If those smells are not motivating enough, this device does also use light and sound to wake up determined snoozers. Well, this morning's text from the book of Revelation is all about a serious wake up call issued to the church at Sardis and to all followers of Jesus, the Christ, the head of the church universal. Jesus does not enlist sweet smells or sunny memories of distant vacation beaches to bring them, to bring us back from dreamland. He calls the church at Sardis dead and about to die. Their deeds are unfinished in the sight of God. He tells them to remember and hold fast to what they have received and to repent, as I've underlined and highlighted in the text. This is an alarming wake-up call. This church was most likely planted by Paul for the Bible tells us that he spoke boldly and argued persuasively about the kingdom of God for two years, so much so that the scriptures record that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord, and that was an amazing accomplishment. The Asia in Acts was a vast area. It encompassed the Roman province of Asia, which made up the western quarter of what is Turkey today and included the coastal regions of Troas, Mysia, Lydia, Korea, the interior region of Phrygia, with the provincial capital of Asia being Ephesus. Historians say that the growth of Christianity was possible in large part because Asia Minor was the crossroads of the Roman world, but we can see the merciful outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. His blessing upon Paul and Paul's willing service and obedience to the Lord Almighty. 
Wyerton is surely a crossroads to the peninsula. May God in his mercy pour out his Holy Spirit upon the people and inspire us, his disciples, to willing and obedient service that we may speak boldly and argue persuasively about the kingdom of God. So that all who live in this province may hear the word of the Lord. Yet something happened between the time that this church in Sardis was planted and the time of Jesus' judgment of it. This is the fifth letter issued by our Lord to an actual existing congregation. As we see, these letters, and this letter specifically, addresses both believers and church-going unbelievers. For then, like now, congregations are made up of both. And like these seven types of churches found in the book of Revelation, they represent seven kinds of problems that typify various congregations of believers today. To get a sense of what Sardis was like, commentators say that in John's time, it was a trade center known for textile manufacture, dyeing, and jewelry. Sardis had been Lydia's capital and was famous for its riches. In fact, the river that flowed close by, it's surmised that there was gold there. In the 7th century BC, Sardis was known for its great wealth and the, un and the seemingly unlimited riches of its king, Croesus, who is credited with issuing the first true gold coins for purity, for general circulation. Yet despite all his wealth, this king led the Lydian Empire into defeat and decline and epitomized the complacency, softness, and degeneration which not only seemed to accompany wealth but also led to their demise. Sardis was considered a mountain fortress which normally would have rendered it very difficult to capture except through the negligence of its inhabitants. Its perimeter and security were beat were breached repeatedly. The rock on which Sardis was built is known as being friable. It means crumbly. Which means that while the slopes were steep because of the cracks and faults, it was climbable. When the king and his city were surrounded by the Persian Cyrus and his soldiers in 546 BC, one of Cyrus's soldiers had noticed a Sardin, or Sardinian, I'm always tempted to say Sardinian, Sardinian soldier climbing down this steep and crumbly slope upon which the city sat to retrieve a helmet he had dropped. That made it obvious to the attacking forces that had surrounded them that they would be able to scale up the slope in that particular spot. So that night, the soldier who had noticed this all transpire led a party of Persian troops up to the citadel by following the fault in the rock. When they reached the battlements, they found them unguarded for the Sardians considered themselves too safe to need a guard. History records that the city was again captured by Antichus III in 214 BC through negligence of its inhabitants and defenders. Twice the Sardians physically lost their city because they were too complacent to keep watch over it. And here Jesus is urging them to wake up to strengthen what remains, to remember what they have received and heard, to hold 
fast and repent. Christ is warning them. The one who redeems us is warning us to watchfulness. Just as the city in Sardis was physically taken, the Lord of light and life is demanding watchfulness. Because he warns that congregation and every congregation that in the eyes of God, you are dead. Even what remains is about to die. Your deeds are unfinished. And if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will know at what time I, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. <clears throat> this is serious. This is not the first time, though, that Jesus has warned us about thieves or of his coming as a thief. Our Lord warns us to keep watch as against a thief coming into our houses. He warns us against thieves who try to claim salvation through means other than through faith in him. He warns us to give to the poor instead of amassing earthly treasures that are subject to thievery. He warns us that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but that he has come that we may have life and have it to the full. And we will read later on in Revelation his warning, look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. I was going to make some smart comment about staying awake in church, but... <laughs> To be awake and alert and clothed is a warning about our behavior. We are shamefully exposed. Our sinful nature, our slavery to sin, our indulging in the whims and idolatries of the flesh are exposed if we are not walking by the Spirit. Not exuding the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, my brothers and sisters. We are called to be free. God's word insists do not use your freedom to indulge the, indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> For you were once darkness, I was once darkness, you were once darkness, but now you and I are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For when we stay awake and alert to false doctrine and teaching, when we walk by the Spirit and serve one another, because we are powered by our faith in Jesus as our Savior, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. To be confident and unashamed before God at his coming whenever that is. It is hard to be confident and unashamed before anyone. If you have to speak in front of somebody, go to an appointment, whatever. It is hard to be 
confident and unashamed. But we as believers can be confident and unashamed before the God of the world, the creator, our creator and master, when we have faith in him. We can be confident and unashamed at his coming whenever that will be. And I think that is why Jesus introduces himself to the church at Sardis as him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Our risen redeemer, our banner, our everlasting hope introduces himself as him who holds the seven spirits of God because the church at Sardis and any other church who is characterized as Sardis is do not have the Holy Spirit within them. They have a reputation of being alive, as Jesus says, but as he, the Almighty Creator, states, you are dead. They could be a tiny congregation or a massive membership with all kinds of programs. But without the Spirit of God, they are dead. Without the Spirit of God, we are dead. For it is the Spirit who gives life. It is God's Holy Spirit that gives life. And I, I need to know the history of the church. So you're going to get a little bit more history of Sardis. In 17 AD, Sardis suffered a catastrophic earthquake, which caused the sudden collapse of a great part of the mountain upon which they were built and resulted in the consequent dis disappearance of much of the very site of the original fortress city. Like some of the other churches of Revelation, Sardis was not without the pressures of pagan religions. Excavations have unearthed an exceptionally large 160 foot by 300 foot temple dedicated to Artemis. It's 78 ionic columns, of which two are still standing, you see there on the right-hand side, <clears throat> are each 58 feet in height. It was dedicated to a local Asiatic goddess, usually referred to as Sybil, who was identified with the Greek Artemis. This patron deity, was believed to possess the special power of restoring the dead to life. Whether it was this heresy that had infiltrated the church, or whether it was full of attending unbelievers, Jesus tells us that they did have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. This is the only good thing Jesus has to say about this church that there were a few people who have not sold their clothes and that they will walk with him dressed in white. Whereas the church of Ephesus pray, was praised for its doctrinal vigilance and endurance and Smyrna was only commended for being spiritually rich and enduring persecution and Pergamon was acclaimed by Christ for holding fast to his name and not denying their faith, the church at Sardis received no praises from the one who holds the seven spirits of God. Sadly and tragically as a whole, with the exception of a few, Sardis was dead. They were dead because they lacked the Holy Spirit. And if we want to know what the Spirit looks like, <clears throat> we can detect, <clears throat> excuse me, if a church needs a wake-up call. 
The prophet Isaiah writes, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> to the world, <clears throat> Jesus says, you have a reputation of being alive, but the seer of hearts, the Lamb of God, defines them as dead. All of its works were just grave clothes, a poor disguise for an ecclesiastical corpse. Today, all that remains of the Christian church are the ruins of Sardis found one mile from the city of Sart. And I read a number of times where they said there were no known Christians living in this village of 5,000. 20th century Tennessee preacher and author Clovis Gillum Chapel tells the story of a young preacher known for doing eccentric things. During the first few years of his service at his first church, this pastor became discouraged and finally told his congregation that their church was dead. He announced that he intended to do its funeral the next Sunday morning. He invited them to come to the service. When that Sunday came, a tender saw that their pastor had placed a casket right in the front of the pulpit. And standing by it, he began his sermon by saying, Now, some of you may not agree with me that our church is dead. So in order to convince you, I'm going to ask you to come forward and view the remains. They all filed one by one, and when they looked down inside the casket, they saw that he had placed a mirror in the bottom so that when they looked in everyone saw their own reflection. Perhaps that young preacher got the inspiration to do that <clears throat> from the wake-up call Jesus issued to the church at Sardis. For the one who is victorious, who heeds Jesus' wake-up call, they are rewarded handsomely, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, their names seared into the book of life, and acknowledged by Jesus, the Lord, before the Heavenly Father and before his angels. Let us be wise and heed Jesus' voice to wake up, to strengthen what remains, to finish what God has set before us to do, to repent and walk with our Savior in the Spirit, in obedience. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord God, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and thank you for what you have said to the church in Sardis, for what you have said to us. Father, it grips our hearts in fear that we would be seen as dead in your eyes. In the name of Jesus, our rock, our salvation and strength, forgive us for denying the urgings and leadings of your spirit. Forgive us for leaving undone those good works that you have set before us. We are unworthy of your forgiveness. We are undeserving of the gift of eternal life when we trust in Jesus, your Son, who died as a sacrifice for our sin. We repent, for we are led by the weaknesses of our flesh. We give in to our selfishness and pride. Forgive us, strengthen us, that we may walk with you 
trusting in your righteousness, clothed in your sanctification. Attune our ears to your voice, that we may hear and heed what your Spirit says to us. Trusting in the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. As we prepare to come to the communion table, we will be singing the first two verses of number 414, O Word of God Incarnate. Please stand as you are able. <laughs> The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's from Romans 13. We gather at this table to remember and celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God incarnate, the first and last, the Son whom God sent into this world to grant life and love to all who believe in him. We come to remember what he gave and what he took away. He gave his life to take away the sin of the world. He brought healing. He ate with outcast and accepted hospitality offered him. He fed thousands. He traveled and lived humbly, yet he taught with authority in, a te in the temple and along the lake shore. He spoke out against injustice and had compassion for the lost. He spoke the truth, yet suffered for it. All who believe in Jesus as the resurrected Son of God, the good and true shepherd, <coughs> who laid down his life for you and I, the sheep, are invited to gather, to commune together, to remember how Jesus' body was broken <coughs> and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us pray. Most holy and merciful Father, we come to your table knowing that it is only your loving grace that enables us to approach and commune with you. For we confess that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
Our words and our thoughts betray our weaknesses. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the commands of Christ. We have not always been the hands and feet and heart of Jesus. Father, you alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts and by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, most merciful Father. We ask in Jesus' name, trusting that in him is found our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. Amen. As you prepare your elements, let me read scripture that reminds us, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us also give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we are here today in obedience to our Lord. As believers, we will inherit eternal life through Christ's broken body and shed blood. We eat this bread in remembrance of the hope we have received because of his sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. The body of Christ broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice and be thankful. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us also give thanks for the cup. Shall we pray? You, Lord Jesus, paid for all of our sins washing us white as snow. This cup represents your blood flowing freely to free us from the grip of sin and the Father's judgment. When in glory we stand beside you and hear she or he is forgiven, then truly we know that we can enter our heavenly rest and stand amazed at the love this cup represents. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. And be grateful. Praise God for feeding us in these holy mysteries. Let us sing the final verse, O Word of God incarnate. Let's stand as your evil. <laughs>
be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and through psalms, hymns, and psalms from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. To those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance.